Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think on behalf of the Writers' Festival and Dr. Chang, thank you very much for coming down on this uh, Monday evening. I understand some parts has uh, been raining, so thank you very much for being here. Um, before we begin with the entire session, I'd like to need to do the necessary. For those of you who are coming to the festival for the first time, welcome. For those of you who have been coming to the festival since uh, last week and Welcome again. All right, um, so very quickly, we'd like to thank um, our sponsor, without whom the festival would not be possible, which is Lee Foundation, the major sponsor, and our venue partner, the National Museum of Singapore. And um, so just a very uh, quick um, house rules, please turn off um, your mobile, any beeping devices. And uh, I think that's about it. And uh, yeah, before I forget, um, my name is Ming Yen. Um, I'll be moderating the session. and. Uh, Please give a warm round of applause to Dr. Jun Chang. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, as you know, um, tonight there's a, uh, the format is that of a lecture, um, but before that, um, I had some previous uh, discussions with uh, Dr. Chang, and we thought we'd do a bit of a preamble first, and then we'll start off with the lecture directly. And I think the most important thing is that. Um, I realized that I have not introduced formally the bio of Dr. Chang, but I was telling her before we came in that I don't think uh, she needs much introduction, and, and you know that. And um, for those of you who might remember, this is her second time to the festival. The last time she was here in 07, she curiously was uh, launching a book of another uh, a Chinese uh, historical figure, Mao Zedong, a whole book on her, on him. And now that she's here, she's looking back at another, she goes back 100 years to look at another historical figure, the Empress Dowager. Now, what is interesting is that in both these books, in relation to the theme of the festival, which is Utopia Dystopia, as I was talking to Dr. Chang, that um, in, in a Mao book, she dispels a myth, um, the Utopia, the utopia which Mao kind of uh, thought he was creating turned out to be a very dystopic China that, um, in, in the wake of uh, his reign. But in the case of the Empress Dowager, while some people may have, some historians have previously depicted a China she was um, overseeing was a kind of a dystopic China, um, Dr. Chang argues a very, a very different picture of the Empress Dowager, almost one which was almost utopic in her mind. So I think with that um, statement and the question, I'd like to present to you Dr. Chang. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I'm extremely um, happy to be here, you know, to say something about my, you know, these two books, a biography of Mao and then the biography of Empress Dowager Tsushi. Now, and, and, and of course, the, the connection uh, with the idea utopia. And of course, the idea of utopia has been given to so many different interpretations. I think very often people say that Mao's society was a utopia, or he was trying to create a utopia. Now, having read the, the, this, this, you know, the book, Utopia, and I felt that there is something to be said about that. And Mao's society, in which I grew up, you know, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and there, is, there was um, quite a, li a, a little bit similarity with, the, with Thomas More's imagination. Now, um, for one thing, we all had to wear this blue uniform-like thing, the one kind of thing. You know how in Utopia everybody had to be dressed the same. So we all in China, we all had to address to dress the same. When I first went to England in 1978, um, because Mao had died in 1976 and China began to reopen. So in 1978, the scholarships for going abroad were awarded on academic basis. I sat for a national exam, I did reasonably well. So I became one of the first group of Chinese to, um, to go and study in the West, in, in, in Britain. Now, when we arrived, we carried the, the utopian Maoist thing with us. We're all wearing the Mao suit, and there were 14 of us. We were not allowed to go out on our own. We had to move in a group. So we were quite a sight in the London streets. 
And the other thing with Utopia I noticed that is that is their, uh, they, they strictly ban uh, drinks or you know drinking places. And when we arrived in England, we were also told, I have told them many things, we mustn't do this and that, the other. But one particular thing was not to visit an English pub, because the Chinese translation for pub, jiu ba, suggested somewhere indecent, with nude women gyrating. Uh, and I, of course, was full of, was torn with curiosity. I spotted a pub across the road from the college, and one day I sneaked out of the college, I darted across the road, I pushed the door of the pub open, and, and of course I saw nothing of the kind, only some old or you know, not so old men sitting there drinking beer. I was rather disappointed, of course. So there is this um, kind of anti-human already this element in the society of utopia. But of course, Mao went much, much further. And for example, um, in utopia, um, you know, people are deprived of many pleasures um, because they want to keep people's desire down. And this, the society was sustained on a non-developing kind of a level. But under Mao, he had ambitions. He deprived his people, not because he wanted the society just to remain like a desireless society. Mao had huge desires, and his desire, ever since he took power, was to turn China into a military superpower so he could dominate the world. And for this purpose, whilst keeping us all, you know, the peasants starving, city dwellers, uh, you know, half a pound of meat a, um, a month, and um, Mao was squeezing out every bit of grain to export to Russia and to Eastern Europe, some to Eastern Europe, to by you know, nuclear technology and equipment, missile technology and equipment, and the whole top range of military industries. And, um, um, and, uh, and he had a political, uh, he had his desire, which he had his dream, he wanted to fulfill it. And for that dream, he didn't mind that tens of millions of people would die of starvation. In fact, Mao knew his people would die of starvation before he started this great leap. You know, as you know, the great leap forward between 1958 and 1961. It was really a great leap for building military industries, which also means huge export of food. And Mao knew at the beginning of that his people were going to die of starvation, but he didn't care. Um, he said, you know, having only tree leaves to eat, so what? Um, you, you know, educate the peasants to eat less, and, um, you know, for all his projects to take off, half of China may well have to die. I must say that when I realized that from you know years of research, um, I was um, I was really shocked, and I knew Mao was bad, but I didn't know he was that bad. I knew he was bad because I you know I grew up under her under Mao, and. Um, and I experienced the Cultural Revolution. You know, my father um, died in the Cultural Revolution. My grandmother died. And I saw him turning the lives of a quarter of the world's population upside down. And yet I felt the world knew astonishingly little about him. And I myself had many unanswered questions. And for example, the famine I just talked about. I wrote about it in Wild Swans, um, you know, the book of 
my grandmother, my mother, and myself, um, our personal lives. And the famine um, I, I wrote about in Wild Swans, but I, I had no idea what was the real reason. And I thought it was because Mao was no good at running the economy. And, um, and he was just... Um, uh, and he was just no good at running the economy. And I then, now it was only in the research of Mao, the biography, did I realize that um, that wasn't the main reason. The main reason was something very simple, which was he exported the food he knew his people were dependent on for survival. And we, you know, we got the figures of Mao's export in those four years. And, um, you know, if you, if you look at these figures, then you realize that if China didn't export the food, not a single person of the 40-something million people had to die. Um, and so, I maybe I should stand up. I, you, I can see people at the back, perhaps. Okay, now, um, okay, what, for, the, for the Mao book, my husband, John Halliday, and I did 12 years of research. And the, the, the reason was, you know, I wrote Wild Swans, before that, um, I, um, you know, afterwards, I wanted to write about Mao and Zhang, who helped me writing Wild Swans, and was also interested in Mao. So we decided to embark on this project together. And we divided our research by language, because I'm Chinese, so I dealt with the Chinese language sources. And Zhang, unfortunately, speaks many languages, so he was landed with the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, um, in particular, he knows good Russian, and he spent years working in the Russian archives, which turned out to be a treasure trove. And, you know, for those who have read our biography, you know, Russia is um, practically on every page of, um, of our biography. And we also, we, we, you know, troved the archives around the world. And we caught a window of opportunity in the 1990s because the Russian archives were open. And in China, the control on the subject of Mao was not nearly as tight as it is today. And also a lot of Mao's contemporaries were alive and were dying to, were eager to talk. So we were able to you know, interview people around Mao. You know, most of them spoke for the first time. And outside China, we interviewed, you know, for example, people from George Bush, the senior, to Henry Kissinger, to the Dalai Lama, to, you know, this um, man in um, Mombuto, uh, Sese Seko, who was the um, tyrant of Zaire, uh, now Congo. He was said to have strangled his... Um, opponents by his bare hand. And of course, his opponents were sponsored by Mao then, um, when China was already making a big um, go at uh, Africa. And, um, and of course, Mao didn't get anywhere, so he had a rapprochement with Mombuto. In fact, we met, um, uh, we, we, John and I were in Hong Kong after some research. We were in the Hong Kong hotel, and John was in the, in, in the bathroom reading his South China Morning Post. And he suddenly yelled, guess who's in this hotel? It's Mombuto. He said, shall we try to find somebody to introduce us? And I said, oh, John, you know, I've done two month interviews. I'm exhausted. I'm going to the hair salon. <laughs> So, so I went to the hair salon, and 10 minutes later, who but Mombuto strutted in. <laughs> and, and he was sitting where very much you, where you are, and he was under this uh, hair thing. <laughs> and he had bits of cotton walls around his head, and bits of towels around his neck, and he was trapped. So. Um, <laughs> 
so I was when I was led to have my hair rinsed. I paused in front of him and got ourselves、uh, a unique interview. <laughs>、uh, and another, the other person we interviewed、uh, in this part of the world was Imelda Marcos. Of the Filipino first lady who had thousands of pairs of shoes, you know, Imelda had this、uh, flirtatious relationship with Mao because Mao was a womanizer. When when he saw Imelda Marcos, he was nearly blind, but his eyes sparkled, <laughs> and、uh, and he sort of、um, picked up Imelda's hand and put it to his lips. And Mao's photographer, who we also interviewed, said he was so scared he didn't dare to take a photograph because he was under orders only to take decent photographs. <laughs> And of course, this wasn't indecent, but you would get anyone other than Mao、um, some ghastly denunciation meetings. You probably have. Seen pictures of and so on, and, but fortunately for us, the newsreel camera kept running and recorded this moment, and so we had a unique we have a unique photograph of a rapt Mao flirting with Imelda in our Mao biography, and、um, so that was.、Um, um, That 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 was、uh, all.、Oh, of course, Imelda. Just this, this little thing. She was batting her eyelid. She talked five hours in full flow, and she batted her eyelids furiously at John, my John, <laughs> <laughs> and、uh, and she then said,、uh, you know, Western men simply don't understand us Eastern women. And so John said, "Have you come across any Western men who understand you?" She said, "Only one person, Richard Nixon." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, now, so that was um, um, so that was、um, Mao, and of course, and after at the end of the twelve years, we. Came to the conclusion that Mao had criminally misruled China, and he was responsible for the death of well over 70 million Chinese in peacetime. And of course, sadly, today his portrait is still on Tiananmen, his corpse in the center of Chinese capital for people to worship. His face is on every Chinese banknote, and、um, and our book Mao: The Biography and my book Wild Swans remain. Firmly banned. Now, after Mao, I then got interested in Empress Dowager Cixi. Now, here is、uh, here is、uh, Cixi. Now,、oh, yes. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, that 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 was her time. She was born in 1835, so that was the Beijing then. You know, camels and the city walls, which are of course all gone. And at the age of 16,、um, she went through one of those periodic nationwide selections for imperial consorts. So together with the hundreds of girls from all over China, she was paraded in front of the emperor, and she caught his eye, and she became one of his concubines, a low-rank concubine. And you know, this is she playing chess with a eunuch who had to stand. And now, Emperor, emperor Xianfeng, her husband, was forced to flee in 1860. And the reason was that the British invaded Beijing. The British wanted more ports of China to open and more trade. But Emperor Xianfeng, like his father and his grandfather, were determined to keep China's doors closed. I mean, the little bit gap that was opened after the Opium War, they wanted to shut, and they certainly don't want more doors to open. And so the British then invaded, led by Lord Elgin, you know, the son of the Lord of the Elgin Marble repute or disrepute.、Um, now Lord Elgin then burned down the old Summer Palace, Yuan Mingyuan, this gigantic compound of of palaces and gardens and, and, and gorgeous things. 
And Emperor Xianfeng was so heartbroken, he refused to go back to Beijing. Then he died in self-imposed exile in the northern wilderness of China. He had, he had only one son, and this son was with Cixi. And this son succeeded him and was the next emperor. <laughs> oh, this, this, of course, is not their son. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is one of the ancestors of the Pekingese dog outside China. Uh, what happened was when Lord Elgin's troops went into Yuan Mingyuan, they found the corpse of an elderly imperial concubine who had not fled with the court and who had died of fright. And around her body, there were five dogs, um, and they took, the British took the five dogs back to Britain, and they became the first Pekingese uh, in, in the world um, outside China. And this particular one was named Luti and was presented to Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria, and this picture, by the way, is from Buckingham Palace, and there is a whole file about Luti in the Windsor Royal Archives. <laughs> It's full of things like uh, Luti refused to drink milk and eat beef and would only eat boiled rice with chicken. <laughs> and and, and uh, what can we do with, about it and so on. And the Queen Victoria had Luti painted um, and, uh, and specifically ordered to um, have Luti put next to something that shows how small she was. Now, after her son was put on the throne, her son was only five years old, so she launched the coup and ousted the eight regents her husband had appointed to supervise her son because she knew that the eight regents would carry on with the old policy of keeping those China, uh, doors of China closed and having confrontation with the West and leading to more disasters. And she asked a very intelligent question, a fresh question, which is, why must we resist contact with the West? Why can't we have contact with the West and benefit China itself? And this revolutionary thinking um, started the open door policy of China and changed China. And this, uh, uh, sorry, this is Cixi being carried to the morning audience by eunuchs. And you know, as a woman, she couldn't have face-to-face -face communication with her officials, who are all male. So she had to sit behind that screen behind the throne, and her son would occasionally be put on the throne. And if you have been to the Forbidden City, you must have seen the vast, you know, magnificent front part with the palaces and completely treeless grounds um, by design, because plants were supposed to soften the atmosphere. And this front part, so she never set foot in, because, because she was a woman. She was confined to the harems at the back of the Forbidden City. Now, now then so she launched her reforms. And she, of course, had men assisting her. I mean, this is a Lord, uh, this is a, a, um, Li Hongzhang. You probably have heard of him, yeah, Li Hongzhang. And here visiting Britain um, with um, Lord, um, Lord, uh, that Lord, that's Lord Curzon, that's sort of the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury. And um, then so she then launched the reforms in China. She employed this man, Robert Hart, who was an ouster man, a British man, and so she employed him as the uh, head of the Chinese customs, and he contributed greatly to the Chinese economy, um, to as much as one third of China's national revenue. Here is Robert Hart with his uh, Western band, but with Chinese musicians. And Hart only left China when Cixi died in 1908. 
you know, for as long as she ruled, nearly 50 years, on and off, mainly on, this foreigner was in charge of Chinese customs extremely efficiently. And then so she started to send envoys abroad. At the time, no Chinese official spoke a foreign language, nor knew anything about the foreign land. So Tsushi so appointed this American, Anson Burlingame, who was President Lincoln's first minister to China after Tsushi opened the door. And after his term finished, Tsushi appointed him to be her ambassador to tour the West. So everywhere he went, he spent 12 years on the road going to all Western countries, being received by Queen Victoria, who wrote about the, in her diary, rather amused that this Chinese envoy was an American, and by you know, all the presidents or the emperors and so on. And uh, everywhere she wa he went, he said, you know, China is now coming to you. So, and this is one of the reforms was to send these children abroad to America, in, in this case, to receive comprehensive education. You know, now from 1861, Tsushi brought in a new navy, a new army, new style, yeah? Industries, modern way of mining, electricity, telegraphs, telegrams, and railways, and new ways of, of um, doing diplomacy. Now, she had a problem, which is that she could only rule behind the throne. When her son, Emperor Tongzhi, came of age, she had to retire to the harem. Now, Emperor Tongzhi was 16. You know, he was not interested in running the state affairs. He was not interested in modernization. He loved sex, um, you know, like a 16-year-old. No. He, uh, you know, he sort of, uh, he loved sex, and he loved frequenting uh, prostitutes, sneaking out of the Forbidden City to visit male as well as female prostitutes. And he died aged 18. And at that point, then Tsushi then adopted um, her nephew, her sister's son, and uh, put him on the throne, aged three and that was Emperor Guangxu. Um, I mean, Emperor Guangxu, yes, em Emperor Guangxu grew up in the Forbidden City, and he was completely different from his cousin, or Cixi. He didn't want to go outside the Forbidden City. He was contented just to be inside the Forbidden City, imbibing classics, which he started uh, reciting from the age of four. So every day he was in this incomprehensible, in the undigest, indigestible, you know, boring, uh, you know, not, may not be boring, you know, to everyone, <laughs> you know, dry classics text. He was a classic scholar, a calligrapher, but modernization was far from his mind. And he was very influenced by his teacher, um, uh, Wong Tonghe, who became his father figure. And Wong Tonghe is a renowned calligrapher. I mean, today his calligraphy in China, I saw on Chinese auctions, fetch very high prices. Um, but he, again, he was against the modernization. He hated foreigners, calling them wolves and tigers. He was against the railway, the, 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 the electricity, and so on. So these two were running China and, and shelved all Tsushi's modernization programs. And of course, the Japanese seized the opportunity and attacked China in 1894. Seized the opportunity of Tsushi being in retirement. So she retired in 1889. Now, of course, you can see, you know, with, in Japan, they have first rate statesmen, and in China, we had this 20 something who's never out of the Forbidden City with a classic scholar as his chief war advisor. I mean, the outcome of the war is not hard to guess. Yeah, China suffered a spectacular defeat. Um, and that was the beginning of China's ruin, as, as many people observed. 
Okay, so I just um, then there was the boxes. I will answer questions when we uh, later when we get to when we get to that, and then <clears throat> then everybody wanted to reform, um, but um, uh, in eighteen eight in eighteen ninety eight, everybody now wanted to reform because China was being defeated by Japan and was being encroached on by. Uh, European powers. You know, Germany came and took a part near Qingdao. I mean, have you all had Qingdao beer? And that's because it was first made by the Germans. <laughs> and then the Russians came and took a bit. The British came and took a bit. The Japanese took a lot and then established some, some spheres of influence. So everybody wanted to, to reform. Even Emperor Guangxu wanted to reform. And in, then Cixi spotted, now this reform, you probably, if you studied Chinese history, you all know about it, yeah, this Wu Xu Bian Fa. Um, I mean, but everybody says it's Kang Yu Wei, who, you know this guy, no, some may know, some may not. Okay, th this man who was the mastermind of this Wu Xu Bian Fa, but far from it. In fact, it was the Empress Dowager Cixi who started these reforms. The imperial edict announcing the reforms of Wu Xu Bian Fa, the reforms of 1898, started with Shang Feng Ci Yu, the emperor on the order of the Empress Dowager. We are now going to have reforms learning from the West and so on. And now, but, but Cixi actually was the first person who spotted the Kang Yu Wei as a very smart um, with reformist with brilliant ideas and so on. And introduced him to Emperor Guangxu, to, to Emperor Guangxu's attention to Kang Yu Wei. But then, of course, being a very smart man, ambitious man, and Kang Yu Wei wanted to be the emperor himself. And, or at least he wanted to be a puppeteer of the, of the, um, of the emperor. Uh, vulnerable, you know, clueless, and so on. And of course, Cixi stood in his way, so he hatched the plot to try to kill her. And Emperor Guangxu was implemented, uh, implicated in the, in the the killing, and so was Emperor Guangxu's favorite concubine, Pao. And if you go to the Forbidden City today, you are inevitably going to be led to see this well where uh, the imperial concubine, Pao, was drowned. And the reason was, um, you know, after the boxes, Cixi was um, uh, fleeing and at the last minute. Uh, she didn't have enough sort of a um, Transport. She only had some mule cart, and she didn't want to take this troublemaker for Cixi with her. And so she asked Cixi asked Imperial Concubine Pao to commit suicide. She of course refused, and Cixi then ordered a eunuch to throw her down that well. Now. So she then repented during her exile, and she made issued decrees of repentance, and then she talked to people around her to show her, her remorse. She honored the imperial concubine Pearl, and she showed remorse to foreigners, and she made peace with the West. This is her coming back from her exile to Beijing, and getting out of her sedan chair, and waving at a foreign photographer who was snatching a photograph from the top of the city wall. And so she, you know, Chinese monarchs used not to be allowed to be seen when they were outside the palace. The huge screens would be erected to hide them from the onlookers. But so she had learned from the people she, sent abroad, she had sent abroad to study the West, that in the West, the Western monarchs wave at their people. So she learned, and this was her first wave. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> And in 1903, Cixi had her first photographs, proper official photographs taken. And at that time, she was nearly 70. But when she saw the prints, and of course, she saw a very pretty, you know, 40 or whatever-ish 
woman. And, um, and the reason was, I mean, in China, people are studying how Cixi kept her face so young. But in fact, the photographs were airbrushed. <laughs> The, uh, the, the negatives are all in America, in the Smithsonian museums. <laughs> so if we come, I had great fun and to find out this was what happened. This was a Cixi without the airbrush, and this was her with the airbrush, <laughs> uh, which she, she had these uh, pictures blown up to enormous sizes and hung everywhere, because it must be, you know, what her mirrors have stopped showing her, you know, for years. But anyway, and because she so loved these prints, she invited the photo studio into the court um, and put him together with the biggest opera star, Peking opera star. By the way, she revolutionized the opera uh, from, and, you know, the opera star Tan Xinpei. And she put the two together and they made China's first film in 1905. So that was quite early. So Cixi could be said to be China's first executive producer of films. Um, now, Cixi tried everything, even wanted to try hot air balloon. But only one thing she didn't try, and that was to be dri driven in a car. Because even though she was launching all sorts of reforms, Okay, I, I, maybe I should talk a little. Uh, you, she, she was launching all sorts of reforms, which I shall briefly mention. She insisted on the court having rigid protocol, so people must kneel in front of her or stand. But of course, then she faced the insurmountable problem of the car, and the driver can't drive kneeling or standing. <laughs> Uh, he had to sit right in front of her, before her. So she decided not to drive in the car. <laughs> but she made many other reforms. And when, when she came back from her exile, the first reform she did, she, her first decree was to ban foot binding. I just wanted to show, you know, my grandmother had her feet bound. And her feet were this size when she was an adult. You know, she was my size. Now, foot binding was not just to put a piece of cloth around the feet. Only the big toe was allowed to grow, and the other four toes and the arch were crushed under a big stone, and the binding was just to stop the broken bones from recovering. Now, this band was, uh, foot binding, was, was ordered by Cixi. She introduced the Western legal systems. She abolished death by a thousand cuts. You know, Lin Chi, you probably have heard of this. And she abolished the old educational system. So the new educational system we're enjoying today have been introduced by her. And, um, <clears throat> and her last project was to turn China from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional one with an elected parliament. And she was going to give the vote to the Chinese. And unfortunately, she died. But of course, the day before she died, she poisoned Emperor Guangxu, her adopted son, who had by then uh, was, her, was under house arrest. Uh, because he had been involved in the plot to, uh, to kill her. Um, so she had him poisoned. And this was, firm, this was established in 2008 through, in Beijing through forensic uh, examination. Now, for, so she had a reason. And the reason was that she knew if she had died and Emperor Guangxu was alive, China would be in the hands of Japan. Very much like the, the Japanese had been trying and succeeding to make Emperor Guangxu their puppet. Very much like, you know, Puyi, they did to Puyi 20 years later. But of course, Puyi was, uh, you know, the emperor of Manchu Kuo in Northeast China. And Emperor Guangxu would have been the whole of China. So, um, here are Cixi's murders and, uh, and, uh, and other things, and I'll leave you to judge, to judge her. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Dr. Chang, for the very colorful um, portrayal of two very different leaders. Although I don't mean to sound irreverent, but uh, your idea, you have given a new definition of utopia, which is to be caught in a hair salon by the person you really most want to interview. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Now, I think um, at this juncture, um, I was wondering, perhaps we just open it to the floor first. Um, I think, you know, following such a colourful description, um, would there be any questions um, from any of you? Okay, I will do it this way. Please raise your hand. Um, I, I think there might be quite a lot. So please raise your hand, and after which, uh, please identify yourself. And uh, since we predicted quite a lot, please keep your questions succinct and to the point. So the gentleman in spectacles over there, please. Good evening, Dr. Chang. My name's Kelvin, and uh, I have two questions for you, actually. The first question concerns your book, um, the, your latest book about Cixi, and I, and I found quite interesting that Cixi often styled herself in a, in, in a fashion similar to that of the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin. So what are your opinions towards her self, self-imposed deification, and um, why your, like, how does she compare to an earlier female monarch, Wu Zetian? And my second, my second question concerns uh, what are your opinions towards the recent developments in and outside China, such uh, in particular those uh, Chinese policies regarding Tibet, Taiwan, and also uh, China's recent leadership? If that's not too provocative a question for you, <laughs> thank you. Shall I just talk? Okay. Now, first of all, about Guan Yin. So she was deeply religious. She was uh, a devout Buddhist, and she was also a dedicated Taoist. You know, in China, in China, those two are not incompatible. And um, she was also um, rev- so she worshipped Guan Yin. I, I suspect one reason was Guan Yin was the only female. God, you know, God, goddess, and so she uh, worshipped Guan Yin. You know, China's modernization, you know, in terms of building the railway, railways in China were delayed for about two decades. And the reason was that this very reform-minded Cixi was, um, was very hesitant about building the railways. In those days in China, as a foreigner observe, observed, the fairest land is reserved for the dead. You know, every extended family had its own tombs, you know, feng shui selected, attended, and so on. And building the railway, I mean, to Cixi and the people around her would disturb these dead souls. I mean, in those days, the Chinese believe in these tombs with religious, uh, with, a, with religious sentiment. And because that's, they, they believe that's where they were going to go after they died. Um, to join the nearest and the dearest. And that took fear out of death. Um, and that was a deep religious sentiment, and so she didn't want to go against until Zhang Zhidong, I don't know that you're familiar with this name, but the major reformer proposed the building the railway of uh, now Jingguang Tielu, then Jinghan Tielu, from Beijing, then to Hankou, Wuhan, now, of course, to Canton. Now, this railway remains China's economic artery and was very important to, to the Chinese economy. And the vision of Cixi at the time is this railway would enable inland China to be linked with the outside world at Hankou with the Yangtze River and to the outside world. And therefore, machines could be imported into China to produce Chinese goods for export. So I think it's very interesting to see that even at that time, you know, we're talking about 1880s. I mean, they were already thinking of the ways of uh, enriching Chinese people, you know, which um, was exactly what happened, you know, after Mao died, Chinese economy took off because of export. Yeah. Okay, now, so all that's about Cixi's religion. Now, the next question, which is a very good question, is, is about Cixi. Wu Zetian, she admired Wu Zetian. So she became an accomplished painter. She had a she had a painting teacher. The painting teacher presented her with a scroll of Wu Zetian in full emperor's regal, and you know signed with the words that emperor 
Wu Zetian um, dealt with dealing with state affairs as the emperor. You know, we know we all know Wu Zetian was the only woman who declared herself the emperor. And Cixi very much admired her. But Cixi never did that, even though her son was, let's face it, no good. Her, her adopted son, Guangxu, is actually pathetic. Um, and, um, and Guangxu actually brought disasters to China, in particular with the war with Japan. Now, now she, she didn't try to make herself emperor. She was always you know, trying to rule from behind the screen. And the reason was she didn't like bloodshed. I, must, I just must have to I have to say, you know, it sounds a bit too sympathetic because she was also capable of immense ruthlessness, of course. And when she conquered Xinjiang, reclaimed Xinjiang, the battle was extremely brutal. And also when she suppressed um, the Republican uprisings later, I mean, she was a steady hand. And, but she tried to avoid, you know, in uh, the civil war, large-scale bloodshed, and so that's why she didn't make herself the emperor. In fact, you know, one most interesting thing is um, at her deathbed, you know, a lot of people were already anticipating China was going to have uh, uh, Republican uprisings and bloodshed because only she could keep the whole the country together. You know, for example, I mean that that was uh, one of the later there was uh, uh, Pu Yi, you know, the two-year-old she made the last emperor. She really wanted the um, uh, the regent, the father of Pu Yi, Zai Feng, to be the regent to keep control. But she knew Zai Feng was not strong enough. So she then accepted republicanism by appointing, by transferring power from Zai Feng to Long Yu, you know, this uh, uh, Emperor Guangxu's uh, empress, who throughout her adult life was downtrodden because Guangxu treated her appallingly and um, and she was really if you in the book you have description from everybody who met her she was really a very pitiful figure now so she in the last hours of her life gave the power of the country the decision to Long Yu I mean my interpretation my explanation is she enabled the Qing dynasty to surrender if the Republican uprisings rose. Zai Feng, like all the other men in the court, absolutely refused to, re to surrender when the Republican uprisings started, when blood, when particularly Manchu blood began to spill. I mean, they all wanted to fight to the last man. I mean, you know this famous saying, um, recently, you recently said in Beijing, you know, Man Cheng Guan Bing Qi Jie Jia, Jing Wu Yi Ren Shi Nan Er. You know, if you surrender, you are no man. Yeah, you know, if you want to be a man, you never surrender. Now, Emperor Long Yu obviously is not a man, and she didn't care to be this Nan Er. So she was able, the person, the only person who was able to surrender, and indeed it was Emperor Long Yu who signed the abdication declaration, who handed over the, who announced the dis dis dissolution of the Qing dynasty, who handed the power to the people of China, as the, as the decree said. Um, and so she did that. She, she buried, basically, her own dynasty to avoid bloodshed, to avoid large-scale bloodshed. And that, for the same reason, she never became Wu Zetian. Good evening and thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I, I was wanting to uh, ask you that uh, when you wrote your book on Mao, uh, you had access to some Russian archives which gave the whole book a new twist. Mm. So when you're writing the book on Sishi, what was it uh, that you looked at, any fresh historical records, archival material, which sort of gave you a very interesting or a very 
a deeply insightful, you know, insight into the story of Sishi. What, what was new? What was well, I mean, lots and lots of things. I mean, they may not be new among Chinese scholars, but they are entirely new outside the Chinese-speaking world. And what happened was after Mao died in 1976, the, um, the archives about Qing Dynasty, which is in the first national archives, which is in the Forbidden City, and that archives opened. And that archive alone had 12 million, has 12 million documents. And of course, I wouldn't dream of accessing all this, but the scholars have been doing the work, the archivists, the historians, they've been sorting out them, editing them, compiling them into volumes, photocopying them, and even digitalizing them. The imperial decrees of, of, under, of Cixi's dynasties were, are all digitalized. So I, I was sitting in the comfort of my London study and bringing up these, these sort of the imperial decrees on my screen. So the, the research was completely different from Mao's time, where we, because there was a lot of cover up, we had to dig out every bit of info. And with Cixi, it was quite, actually quite easy. I mean, so every word in that book is based on the document. Apart from a court document, there were courtiers' diaries, you know, Wong Tonghe, for example, earlier, kept rich, detailed, and you know, such um, incredible, wonderful for a historian, mm, and diaries, um, and left writings, letters, you know, eyewitnesses, accounts, and you name it. And you know, we have, uh, I mean, my book, for my book, I, I absolutely refuse to look at the yesh, you know, those uh, rumored histories and this, uh, this legend um, or novels, and, but just, just purely based on documents. And the documents are so rich. Uh, and secondly, um, was Sishi uh, influenced by any of the Western missionaries uh, who sort of um, raised a lot of uh, um, resistance to foot binding? any Western missionaries in particular? <clears throat> yes, about foot binding. I mean, Tushi hated foot binding. Um, I, I think even before, um, one can't say exactly from when and when, but I, I'm, I'm sure she was also influenced, but she also hated it with, her, with gut, gut feeling, because she didn't want to see things twisted in an unnatural way. In fact, in her court, you know, the Pekingese, before the Pekingese were bred into these tiny birds, uh, tiny uh, dogs, I don't know if you've seen them. So the, courtier, the courtiers would carry them in their ample sleeves. And so she banned the, this practice and stopped breed, uh, breeding Pekingese because she, as she said to the American, uh, to her American portraitist, the painter, Miss um, Carl, and she said she can't see why, you know, these people should be, these dogs should be bred in a very unnatural way, being restricted with iron mesh, you know, whatever, to, for men's pleasure. She, no doubt she hated foot binding, and I think there was, uh, quite possibly uh, missionary influence and quite possibly other, um, other people's views, other people of uh, progressive mind, yeah. Are, are there any other questions from, from okay. Um, so we have the gentleman in front and then the one behind after that, all right? Hi, Dr. Chang. I finished reading your book last night. Oh. And uh, I have a question. Towards the end of the book, you made a remark that Sushi was a giant but not the same. Would you say the same of Mao? <laughs> well, Mao was certainly no saint, and this is no, there was no question. Giant, I think he, he was not. Um, I would say he was not. Um, now, giant for me would have to be somebody who had done good things for China. And so she brought China from a medieval society into modernity. And I think she was a giant. You know, when, when Deng Xiaoping changed China after Mao died, he didn't invent a new a China. He was returning to a model 
that had already been first set by the Empress Dowager Cixi. I mean, in her time, the difference, the creation of modern China was, you know, really was something brand new, completely different. Um, so I think in that way, and also she introduced the modernity to end cruelty, you know, like banning food binding, death by a thousand cuts, to give people more freedom. She brought in free press, I mean, um, even at her own peril, because these free press were usually anti-Manchu. Um, and, and, and some were even anti-monarch. And, um, and she, you know, espoused the women's liberation. Um, in fact, you know, people were writing in 1903 that the 20th century is was a century of women's rights, Nu Quan. So for all these achievements, I would say, and not, not to mention she was trying to introduce the vote. Of course, she was trying to keep her uh, dynasty. But when she realized she couldn't, she accepted republicanism because she, her goal was not to preserve her dynasty, her ultimate goal. Her goal, ultimate goal was to preserve China. And it was also for that reason she murdered her adopted son. Now, Mao, Mao's goal was all the time for himself. I mean, let's, you know, just think about this great leap forward, you know, building China into an industrial, industrial um, country. Now, Cixi started the, the Navy and spent giant sums of money buying ironclads. So it's not that she didn't care about national defense. And Mao spent all his money he took from the Chinese to build military industries. So seemingly, they had you know, something in common. But the difference is proportion. Now, Cixi, whilst building the navy, the military, she spent equally large sums of money to buy food to feed the Chinese population. And large-scale Chinese food import started in 1867 uh, under Robert Hart. I mean, every year there are statistics, um, you know, they're all on, re in, on record because of the customs. I and mean, every year, from hundreds of thousands of taels to, to tens of millions of taels were spent to buy food. But Mao, in the 1950s, before, she was, before Mao was starting the Great Leap, Mao said, we must stop this food buying thing that had started from the old rotten Qing dynasty that had been perpetuated by the Beiyang Zhengfu, by the warlord's government, and by the nationalist government. And so Mao not only stopped importing food, he exported food um, to, for this industrialization. And the reason was because he wanted all this militarized industrialization to happen in his lifetime, so he could enjoy the benefit because you know other Chinese communist leaders like Liu Xiaoqi, they, we, yes, we want industrialization, but let's first improve people's living standard, which is also, I mean, current, the current approach. We must first improve people's living standard, then build on the wealth. And the, but Mao, no, he didn't want to improve people's living standard. He wanted to starve his people and starve his people to death to build his military superpower so he could personally benefit. And he was 60 when he took power. And Mao reckoned um, he could at least live to 73, which is the year Confucius died, <laughs> which is how old Confucius lived. And so Mao, Mao said, I can you know, outlive Confucius, so, which is why in the Great Leap Forward, I mean, we, we, in China, we all knew that Mao wanted this military industrialization to be achieved achieved in 15 years, well, then later, you know, to in eight years, in four years, even in two years, all because he can, he, so he could enjoy it. So I don't think that's the conduct of a giant. And the, the question from the gentleman behind there. Um, hello, yeah, I wanted to ask, um, if Mao is really that bad, 
why is it that people in China, until now, people are being more educated, they're being more aware of what is happening and what has happened to them. But why is it still that they still treasure Mao and they still put him ahead compared to someone like, say, Empress Dowager Shisi? Why is it that Mao still is so important? Should we really forget, like, maybe the benefits he brought about, like, true culture? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, did you say benefits of uh, Mao's benefits such as culture? Well, I mean, uh, the slogan of the Cultural Revolution was to smash the four olds. One of them was the old culture. I mean, you go to China today, I mean, how, how much of China's glorious old culture is still visible? I mean, it's heartbroken to see I mean, Mao's damage to Chinese culture is something I think that is the most painful for me even just to think of. I mean, Mao even criticized Stalin when he, you know, basically burned books in China. And he, he said Stalin allowed European classics to survive. Stalin made a mistake. And I grew up under Mao. When the Cultural Revolution started, I was 14. Schools were closed, the books were burned. For 10 years, the books we could read could be counted on the fingers of your two hands. And that was Mao. And meanwhile, he loved books. You know, Mao was a book lover. And his favorite uh, um, pastime was to read. So he had these giant beds constructed. And half the beds would be piled a foot high with books. You know, we have these pictures in our Mao biography. You could see um, piled this high with books. So he could wake up, roll over, pick up a book, and start reading. And the problem is he wouldn't allow one billion Chinese to read. I mean, this is not a man who is a giant. This is back to the old. So that's the culture. As for why is Mao still worshipped? Well, I mean, China is still ruled by Mao's successors. I mean, it is they who don't want to take Mao's portrait down to Tiananmen. And, and the people have no say about it. I mean, my books are banned. I mean, you know, I, I'm allowed to go to China to see my mother for up to two weeks a year, but I'm sort of under, also under strict control. <laughs> I mean, I undertook not to address, you know, public, um, not to, not to um, talk to the press, and not to even see most of my friends, except a few who are very old, who had nothing, who are very old, old friends who had nothing to do with politics, and my mother. I mean, if they allow books like mine to go into China, I mean, if they allow people to vote, whether we should take down Mao's portrait, see what would happen. Okay. Um, ten minutes ago, um, the organizers have said we have only five minutes left. I was wondering if I could have uh, permission to have just one more question. Is it okay? Okay. Sorry. Uh, two, two questions. The gentleman in front and after that, uh, Philip. Okay. Uh, so we have the last two questions. I have a question for you concerning Utopia and a dystopia. So uh, would you agree that um, utopia and dystopia may differ in form, but um, sort of uh, the consequence is basically the same. It is the deprivation and uh, infringement of um, sort of uh, human rights at the individual level. All right. Both are visions and ideas uh, that sort of promote someone's vision, someone's agenda, at the expense of the human being as an individual. Yes, I absolutely, I totally agree. I absolutely agree. I mean, you know, you know when people uh, somehow um, talk about utopia as though it was an ideal society, it might be ideal for the leaders to organize the society, to control them, put them, keep them in order. But on the individual level, it was hell. 
you know, it was really, um, I mean, you know, the, 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 you know, everybody was under watch. I, earlier we talked a little bit. I mean, in, in China, they sort of under every, well, may I just tell just one story. When I first came to Britain, of course, coming just from this sort of um, utopia, disutopia-like society, and I, and not being allowed to go out on our own, of course, I sneaked out and I lived in fear all the time. And one warning were particularly were given was not to have a foreign boyfriend. Um, um, anyone or um, girlfriend, anyone who had a, a foreign boyfriend or girlfriend would be carted off back to China in a jute sack and drugged. So I firmly believed it. And I, of course, also, of course, I mean, you know, I, I then had boyfriends. I mean, you know, the, the thing is often is human nature is such. The more you forbid people, the more they want to do it. And, but and I, I would remember when I was in London, if I was with somebody, I'm miles away from Chinese embassy, my legs would turn into jelly. And if I was in a car, I would, I would just sort of slide under the seat so my head would disappear from the window because I was afraid somebody might see it and report and I might be, you know, carted off in jute sack. Uh, and, um, and, and of course, I think at that time the embassy was not doing that kind of thing because China was changing. But such was a utopia, disutopia society generate inevitably fear fear. I mean, that's also when I started to use makeup because I thought um, this might provide a satisfactory disguise from the embassy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And last question from Philip. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chung, for a wonderful talk. And also thank you for not drawing the obvious conclusion that women leaders are much better than men leaders. Um, but I thought I would ask you this question. Do you think the Communist Party of China will ever have a, a woman leader, and if so, how long is it going to take? <laughs> yes, we, we, you know, it's. I mean, Tsushi was um, uh, was, as I say, a giant. Not, uh, not because she was a woman. Um, but of course, she actually also benefited from being a woman whilst being disadvantaged as a woman. You know, she is always described as that semi-illiterate old lady. I mean, she was semi-illiterate, but that might have been her blessing because she then didn't spend 10 years like these men from the age of four to imbibe these Confucian classics, which they didn't understand. I mean, her mind was left free to, to like a sponge to soak up new ideas, which was why when she came to power, she immediately sent people abroad and to get, gather all sorts of new ideas, which she was to absorb in her mind. Now then, of course, because she was a woman, she was inevitably drawn to Western ways because her report, her um, envoys came back and said, gosh, you know, in the West, the people, women could walk with men arm in arm, um, and they, um, they could dance, I mean, there were, you know, detailed dis uh, descriptions of fabulous dancing, you know, I give at the time, they could swim, they could skate, and they could socialize, and they could be monarchs. I mean, one envoy said, um, in, in Eng England, is ruled by a woman. Um, she, uh, she is a, she's Queen Victoria, and everybody sings her praise. And all these are bound, were bound to make Sashi feel drawn to Western ways. So I think that contributed to her reforms. Uh, um, I mean, as the future, I'm. I'm completely no good at protecting the future. I'm sort of rather better at uh, looking at the past uh, from a distance. Okay, um, thank you very much, Dr. Chan.
And I think so, we've come to a conclusion about wonderful lecture, not just about two leaders, but I think Dr. Chang in the past hour or so, and through your questions, have given a panoramic view of both Chinese history and Chinese culture and Chinese way of life. And thank you very much for being such a wonderful audience also, um, to have fielded such wonderful questions. Um, okay, for those of you all, now we go back to the nitty gritties. Um, those of you who would like to have, you know, autograph your books by Dr. Chang, the book signing will take place here. So please uh, form a line in the centre, and if your uh, books are for sale, um, those who want to have a books, uh, buy the books, please form a line by the side of the room. Thank, Thank you. you.